This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time you're watching us. So happy you tuned in for another edition of the Farm Monitor. As you can see, no Kenny this week. Ray D'Alessio here flying solo with you for the next half hour. Coming up, as we head to the polls in the coming weeks, be on the lookout for Amendment 3. What is it and the positive impact it could have on the timber industry here in Georgia? Also on the program, they're a fall tradition in Georgia and really throughout the country for that matter. But have you ever seen what goes into constructing a corn maze? We'll show you. Plus. Well, hey, everybody, Ranger Nick. Coming up this month, I'm spending some time in the woods just outside of Athens, and I'm going to show you a little tool that can help you, if you've got trees on your land, understand how old they are and what that information can tell you about the success of that land. That and so much more starts now on the Farm Monitor. With midterm elections just a few weeks away, voters will have a number of important decisions to make that will affect the entire state. And one of those is Amendment 3, also known as the Fair Forest Tax. Devin Jones tells you why voting yes could have a major impact on forestry in Georgia. When talking about agriculture in the state of Georgia, forestry isn't the first thing that comes to mind. However, it is actually the top forestry state in the nation with more than 22 million acres of privately held forest land. Those acres are providing jobs across the state, about 144,000 jobs, generates about $35.2 billion worth of economic activity uh, throughout both rural and urban areas in the state. We're the number one exporter of forest products from any of any of the state in the nation uh, to, to countries all over the world. Uh, but most importantly, it's providing clean air and clean water to all of the state citizens. And with that in mind, the association, along with the support of the Georgia Farm Bureau, are hoping to pass Amendment 3, which will change the way forest land is taxed within the state. Uh, timberland in Georgia pays the highest ad valorem taxes of any state in the, across the southeast. That's even with land that's in Cuba or in Flippa. And so that puts pressure on that land to be able to stay in trees. More importantly, there's about 4.7 million acres that's not in either one of those two programs, and it pays about uh, 10 times in some cases more. Uh, property taxes are one of the biggest expenses that a forest landowner runs into. And Georgia has uh, the highest property taxes, forest land of any state in the southeast, which makes it a little more difficult. Uh, this new uh, amendment will help uh, even those uh, property taxes across the state and it will make it fair for all property owners uh, in the state of Georgia. And that's not the only change, as it will allow the land to be assessed at fair market value by the Department of Revenue instead of the 159 different tax assessors in each of the counties throughout the state. We own land in multiple counties, and the valuation placed on the land for the same forest land use in different counties varies wildly from year to year. And we need uh, some consistency and, and, uh, in, in the assessments so that uh, we can plan our expense out of the ledger. It's uh, just fair for the, the property owner in Hancock County to be treated the same way as the property owner in Greene County, Oglethorpe County, any counties around. It's just a, a thing of fairness. Everybody wants to be treated the same way and treated fairly, and this uh, amendment will help uh, ensure that that happens. This uniformity will provide clarity for landowners as they look to budget for the years in between the cuttings of their tree stands. And when you're looking at uh, a planning a 35 year cycle with only a couple of times that you get revenue, a couple of years that you get revenue in that 35 years, if you can't know what those expenses are going to be with some certainty, it's a, it's a discouragement not only to going into forest land ownership, but to maintaining it. So while there will be a number of important issues to vote on in November, this one should be taken very seriously as well. This is one of the opportunities that we only have once every generation to be able to address the fact that Georgia's tax system isn't necessarily up to date with our, with our modern economy. And where we see that hitting us the most is in the rural parts of our economy and in Avalorum taxes for landowners. Reporting from Forsyth, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In the meantime, the image is still a tough pill to swallow. Cleanup efforts continuing in South Georgia following the widespread destruction 
of Hurricane Michael. This video taken by the Department of Agriculture just days after the storm hit. Commissioner Gary Black calling it the most widespread and devastating hurricane to impact Georgia's ag. Vegetable crops in the hurricane hit area considered a total loss. Early estimates say Michael's damage to Georgia agriculture could reach $1 billion. We, of course, will have much more on the after effects of Michael and what's being done to help farmers on next week's show. On a brighter note, the fall festivities and agritourism trips are now in full swing, and that means many folks are scratching their heads wondering where the heck they went wrong. Should I have stayed straight, maybe taken a left turn instead of a right turn? Talking, of course, about the many corn mazes Georgia has to offer. Our John Holcomb reports on the popular attractions starting from ground zero. Fall, a time of cooler temperatures, beautiful leaves, and all kinds of activities to do with the family. One of the most popular fall attractions are corn mazes, and one of the most notorious ones in the state is down in Albany at Mark's Melon Patch. I paid him a visit to talk about this year's corn maze on his farm. The corn maze actually has a has a, our logo in it, Mark's Melon Patch, in the middle, kind of in the middle of it, and then it's surrounded by farm animals and a tractor and the little. That's the two mile maze. The the half mile maze has like. Uh, farm it's like a farm scene with barns and all it's really cool it all blends well it all they complement each other the question myself and a lot of people have is how do they make corn mazes that question couldn't have come at a better time as a crew was down there working on mark's corn maze that day i talked to him for a while and found out about their business and how they design and cut corn mazes i heard about a corn maze and i thought it sounded like a really fun idea um, i was farming at the time and so I thought, oh, I'd like to do one out on our farm. And so we were doing a lot with GPS at the time. And uh, in fact, my brother had a GPS company that we were working with. And we developed a way to cut a corn maze out with GPS. They decided to turn it into a full-time business called Maze Play. He and his family travel all over the United States designing and cutting corn mazes. We go coast to coast. So um, uh, we do a little over 100 mazes every year. I talked with him for a bit and he explained their designing and maze cutting process. To begin with, we've got to figure out what the field dimensions are so the, the customer that we're working with will provide us with some field dimensions and then we start with that and then they give us a design idea and then we start drawing up pictures or find something that they may want that we've already done before um, and work with that and then once they've approved that then we start turning that into a maze design and go for that. From there, um, get it put in the fi uh, those field dimensions, um, and then um, once that's approved, um, then we come out and we cut in the field. And so, in the field, we're taking that uh, design idea uh, or that maze design, and we lay it out so it fits, um, verify that it fits the field and with GPS, and then we have GPS on the tractors where we follow basically the paths through the maze and cut the, the corn out that doesn't need to be there. They can do just about any design you could think of. We can get pretty intricate and pretty neat designs. This one we've got uh, Mark's Melon Patch logo right in the middle of the, the corn maze so it's kind of fun so we can make it custom uh, and uh, provide something that uh, is unique to the area and the maze that we're working with. Reporting in Albany for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick here. Coming up, I'm gonna show you a little bit more about this old loblolly pine tree and the tool that I'm using to determine how old it is, something you can do at your house too. That's on the other side of this. Ten days before Hurricane Florence ravaged the Carolinas, Texas farmers and ranchers were there in North Carolina, experiencing agriculture in the Tar Heel State. The crops here in North Carolina that are unique to North Carolina particularly are tobacco, uh, sweet potatoes, the livestock and poultry industry make up two-thirds of the farm income here in North Carolina. North Carolina farmers were just beginning to get whispers of a storm brewing, but they still took the time to meet with their Texas counterparts to show them crops not seen in the Lone Star State. 
the North Carolina's weather being as hot as it is, because sweet potatoes are a tropical plant, they thrive in this kind of weather. So it's really neat to watch that grow, and like my dad has always said, it's underground, so when you start digging them, you don't really know what you're going to get, and, and most of the time it's a treasure. These East Coast growers have some of the same concerns and challenges as Texans. Labor, water, regulations, and a disconnect between the farmer and the average family, causing some to even take legal action against local growers claiming they're a nuisance. And that's something that's quite worrisome for the rest of us in agriculture uh, because uh, some of those farms were there uh, long before uh, the folks that, that moved in and then decided to file that nuisance lawsuit. A stop at Cotton Incorporated outside of Raleigh was fascinating for farmers from the nation's top cotton growing state. Then it was time to trade hog barns for horse ranches as the Texans left North Carolina for Kentucky. Once in the bluegrass state, equine took center stage, both thoroughbreds near Lexington and saddlebreds near Shelbyville. The thoroughbreds mainly are for, for racing distances. The saddlebreds are for showing. Uh, used to, they would use the saddlebred to go to town. They are, they're three to five gated horses and they're easy riding. Uh, the thoroughbreds, strictly for racing. But Kentucky agriculture isn't a one-trick pony. Cattle and poultry are also important livestock to the state. A visit to Bluegrass Livestock Market showed the importance of cows to Kentucky. Plus, this state-of-the-art sale barn is used for more than just a weekly auction. While soybeans and corn may be Kentucky's top row crops, there's another emerging plant, hemp, grown specifically for the cannabinoid CBD. Arthritis, uh, uh, insomnia, anxiety, there's just a number of, uh, of different things that it is anecdotally has proven that it is helpful with. Because of hemp's infamous cousin, farmers must have a license through the Kentucky Department of Agriculture to grow industrial hemp. Different producers have different challenges all over the United States, and so it's getting to see that from North Carolina to Kentucky, you get to see what they're dealing with and, and how we can kind of all come together to, to solve those problems. Whether it was a roadside vegetable market, a tobacco farm, or a horse ranch, the Texans felt right at home because growers in all three states know the bond of agriculture is one that doesn't end at the state lines. All right, pop quiz. Do you know what dendrochronology is? Anyone? All right, well, here's a hint. It involves trees and history. This month, Ranger Nick explains why it's important for those with trees on the property to understand dendrochronology. Well, we've heard that age-old debate. If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? We'll never know. But one thing we will know after today's segment is what the inside of a tree looks like and how the inside of that tree can tell you about how old it is and maybe even how to manage your land. I'm standing here with a little blue colored tool that's called an increment bore that you two at home can get one of these guys. And what I want to do this month is show you how this tool can be used to extract something from a tree and tell you how old it is without even needing to cut it down. This little increment bore has got three parts. And before we go inserting this into a tree, I want to show you this little guy. This is called a spoon or a little extractor. Very important part of what we're going to be doing today. Also inside of this guy is a little auger. It's like a little drill bit that we are going to put into this tree. I'm going to use this fancy thing that is a very academic word called a handle <laughs> that we're going to put this into, screw this into the tree and take out what looks like a little core, a little dowel rod. And we're going to determine how old the tree is and some of the history behind it. So join me. Let's go do that with the tree right now. So a lot of people don't know it, but my background is actually in forestry. So being able to be out in the woods today with you and show you how to use one of these things called an increment bore is so cool. And you can do this at home too. So I've put the auger, the little bit part, into the handle, very sophisticated term. And I've got my little extractor, my little spoon, which is basically just a long piece of metal that has a little trough in it. I'm going to use him in a second. I'm going to put this guy in at about four and a half feet off the ground, which us foresters call diameter at breast height, DBH. I'm going to put this guy into the ground right here, and I'm going to start grinding it in. One turn at a time, and I'll put this right in my vest. You don't want to lose that little extractor there. Kind of expensive part. Let's start screwing this in here. One turn at a time. And through the magic of TV, we're going to kind of speed this up a little bit. <laughs> I'm really working my arms on this one. I'm going to start screwing this guy in like this. And I'm going to do this until 
I reach a certain point in the tree. And in fact, I'm gonna use my little extractor, this little spoon thing whoop, that I put right here in my pocket. I'm gonna use this to determine how deep in I need to go. So I'm gonna kind of use this to measure and see whether I've hit the center or the pith of the tree yet. Got a little bit further to go. I'm gonna screw a little bit more. Remember righty tighty, lefty loosey. Put that guy in there. I wanna get through the center, but not all the way through. And let's stop it right there. Now, I want to take this little guy right here, my little extractor, my little spoon, and I'm going to flip him over upside down. I'm going to put him into this little hole right here. Whoop. All the way up till it's flush. And then I'm going to turn it one turn the other way. Now that little trough is sitting up like a little basket, and I'm going to pull this out very slowly. And this is the magic part. Take a look, and I wish you were here to smell this. Take a look at how beautiful that little core is that comes out of the tree. And you can see right there is the center. That's the pith. And we go all the way out to the bark. Now, in a second, I'm going to show you how do you read this and determine how old it is and what this little core can tell you about the history of your land. So let's go check that out now. So I can show you some things along this guy. And I've got my pencil here to point to it real up close. First of all, this is where that little tree started growing. This is the pith. This is where his life began, his or her life began. Right here, I'm going to go from right in the center and count out to the edge of this orangish piece and get to one year. And then I'm going to count out and go to here and get to two, three, four, five. And you can see as you go along, we've counted this ahead of time. It's about 30 years old. And the really cool thing about this is you'll see that there's a wider distance between some rings and a closer distance between others. And what that tells us is the wider the distance, the better the growing conditions for that tree. So that year was a really, really good year. The tighter the rings, the slower it grew. And maybe back then there was a drought. Maybe we needed to fertilize then or clear away some competition. So this really does tell us a tremendous story about your forest on your land. And it goes all the way out there to the bark. So that's a really, really cool thing. I'm going to encourage you to do this on your land. People even do this with old log cabins. They'll drill into those logs and see how old those logs were to determine maybe how old that cabin is. That's cool. And every once in a while, you'll see a ring that has some black on it or that has some nicks in it. And that's maybe where there was insect damage or a fire that came through. It's a little history story in this little core. Well, y'all know what to do. Hop online, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page because we're going to wrap this one today and check out the Farm Monitor Facebook page while you're online. And until next time, as always, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, I had a blast on this one. We'll see you back here next month. See ya. Great job, Nick. Now, when we come back, brace yourself. Charles Denny on the primal terror that comes from getting lost in this corn maze. The tour starts by a real cemetery decorated in early dead cedar. From there, it's Judgment Day. Deeper and deeper into the rows of corn, but plants aren't the only living or dead thing here. Welcome to the Mayfield Haunted Corn Maze, where escaped convicts and girly ghouls enthusiastically greet each visitor who dares to enter their realm. And I think I genuinely think it's just an adrenaline thing. I think people get don't realize that they're getting shots of adrenaline, and they are, and and they get it's it's almost like they get hooked on being scared. Fully acknowledging that scaring people is a hobby, Michael Mayfield is a child of the corn and a dairy. His family is known for milk, but their thousand-acre farm also includes two corn mazes one that's kid-friendly, and this scroll through the stalks that's a tad more sinister. It's a different type of excitement than the corn maze. Corn maze, I tell people, is hugs and warm and awe, and that's wonderful, don't get me wrong, but people are amped up when they come out of a haunt. These corn mazes tap into something primal, something fundamental that's inside all of us. Call it evolutionary psychology. It's the fear of being lost. This unique blend of ag, Halloween, and horror yields cash for crops in a different way. Megan LaFew with UTIA Center for Profitable Agriculture says agritourism generates $50 million in Tennessee, and much of that coming in the Halloween season. 
Is that a ghost walking behind her in this soundbite? Fall is a wonderful time for fun on the farm. The weather is beautiful and people want to get outside, so it's a perfect time for people to come out to the farm and play and have some family fun together. Though this place, maybe only the Adams family would be comfortable here. At any rate, the corn is high, the spooks are active, and the frights are plentiful. When you're lost, you may find good scary fun. Just be prepared to exit the grounds quickly. This is Charles Denny reporting. Finally this week, beef, it's not only what's for dinner, it's also being credited for helping Lance Picus earn a spot on the wildly popular TV show American Ninja Warrior. Lance's day job is helping raise cattle in the central mountains of Idaho, but at night, he's known as the Cowboy Ninja. So American Ninja Warrior, they're on their 10th season. I happened to come across it on season two or three when it was on a cable network television show. So one of those high channels, I, I didn't even get it at the time. I happened to catch it at a friend's house. And I thought, wow, this looks cool. He said he was doing this Ninja Warrior. And I just put in a pivot up the road and he's up there swinging and dancing around on that. I go, oh, okay, this boy's serious. Um, my dad growing up didn't know what he wanted to do, so he did construction, did a little bit of work here and there, and then so we bounced around from Utah, Washington, Montana, and uh, I've always kind of lived in smaller towns and, uh, you know, felt like I was associated uh, with like farming and ranching, but I was always from the outside. Um, it wasn't until I left uh, school and uh, met my uh, future wife, spent the summer on her uh, family's ranch, and I just really fell in love with the ranch work. And you really realize how much more is involved kind of being from the outside and then coming in and seeing how much work really goes into it. You know, I've, I've always, I've done little things here and there and been a part of like baling hay and like changing pipe and stuff like that, but to really get a firsthand experience with it and just kind of grew and just kept coming back. And uh, then after school, we moved here, set up permanently and uh, never left and plan on living probably the rest of our lives here. Uh, wow. Built a house, had two kids, and really enjoy having them. Uh, on the ranch and raising them here. Well, family means a lot, and he he values family life, and and we have a a, a really good family. My father-in-law has taught me so much, uh, not just you know about ranch work, but you know he's always kind of instilled and told me hey, if you're gonna do something, you know, might as well do it right. For Ninja Warrior, you got to be really mentally focused on what you're doing. And not only is it important for me after working out and working hard on the ranch to make sure that I'm getting enough protein intake, not, not just at night, but just throughout the day, beef is just a great source of that. And as my kids growing up, there's nothing better to make sure they're getting the, the food that they need to develop. Um, a lot of people, see, you know, they, they say I'm strong, and I, I look at, you know, people in my life. Um, you know, you got family strength. And for me, it, it's, a, it's people behind me, it's people that support me, it's the people that, you know, are, are there for me that, you know, are, are strong. And, you know, maybe their strength is uh, getting shown through me. What's for dinner? Oh, well, it'll probably be beef. <laughs> Great story and special thanks to the Beef folks for allowing us to share that with you. Unfortunately, that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. As always, for the latest ag news and happenings, be sure to check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. 
Take care, everybody. See you next week right here on the Farm Monitor.